Hello, uh, I'm Mark Chris, the head of adult programming for the Central Arkansas Library System. And I'm also a uh, hit Civil War historian, having uh, written and edited about a dozen books on the subject. And this is a continuing series of uh, programs about the Civil War as it occurred in Arkansas. So uh, as uh, Frederick Steele's Union Army limped back into Little Rock uh, in May of 1864, after the failed Camden expedition, the beaten Yankees may have looked forward to resting in relative safety, but within days of their return, one of the Confederacy's best cavalry raiders would cross the Arkansas River and run circles around federal Arkansas for the entire summer. Joseph Orville Shelby was 30 years old in May of 1864. A slave owner and veteran of the 1850s border war, border war with Kansas Free Staters, Shelby organized a cavalry company in 1860, equipping them at his own expense from his substantial fortune as a Missouri rope maker. He saw action at Carthage and Wilson's Creek, Missouri, Pea Ridge, Cane Hill, Prairie Grove, and Helena, Arkansas, and in the Camden Expedition, where his horse soldiers played prominent roles in the smashing Confederate victory at Marks Mills. In addition, following the capture of Little Rock on September, September 10, 1863, Shelby had embarked on a raid into Missouri in September and October that covered 1,500 miles, destroyed over 1 million in federal supplies, and generally kept the Yankees in his home state in turmoil. He was commissioned a Brigadier General on April 1, 1864. The core of his command throughout the summer would be his Iron Brigade, the 1st, 5th, 11th, and 12th Missouri Cavalry Regiment, and Captain Dick Collins' 2nd Missouri Field Artillery Battery who had battled and raided in Arkansas and Missouri since 1862. One Union soldier who had, who had met Shelby's Iron Brigade in combat during the Camden Expedition described them as all Missourians and the best rebel cavalry in the West. They are all well mounted on the best kind of horses. The men wear our uniforms. They will fight for we have felt of them and can vouch for that fact. Within days of the beaten Yankees uh, returned to Little Rock from the Camden Expedition in early May, Shelby had orders to head north gather the mixed bag of deserters, partisan bands, and bushwhackers in northeast Arkansas and form them into fighting units, and to, quote, occupy the valley of White River and prevent its navigation and the use of Little Rock and Duvall's Bluff Railroad in every possible manner and fashion. The targets were well chosen. The White River was an essential artery for Union riverine warfare and commerce, a swift river that would prevent that pro a swift river that provided a deep enough channel to ensure uh, safe passage for steamers along its entire length, except during the rare occasions of exceptionally low water. The Federal Post at Duvall's Bluff, established in August 1863 as Major General Frederick Steele's army moved west to capture the Arkansas capital at Little Rock, was a hub for this river uh, commerce, with supplies offloaded there for transport to Little Rock by the Memphis and Little Rock Railroad. This 49-mile uh, rail line linking Huntersville, which is modern-day North Little Rock, with the Vols Bluff was an essential communications and supply route for federal troops in the interior of Arkansas. A Kansas cavalryman summarized the importance of the railroad to federal forces in a letter to his wife, writing, They know if they can destroy that railroad, we are cut off from our base of supplies, which would weaken more than any other thing they could do. I think the railroad track will have to be guarded all the way through the summer and fall by a heavy force. The Federal line along the Arkansas River was porous as Shelby headed north for his summer of raiding and mayhem. Steele's main forces were essentially holed up in armed camps at Duvall's Bluff, Little Rock, Fort Smith, Fayetteville, and Helena, while other troops were scattered in small groups of places like Lewis, uh, Lewisburg, Norristown, and Clarksville to conduct operations against guerrillas and raiders who preyed on the Federal communication line of the Arkansas River. For the first time in Civil War Arkansas, the initiative belonged to the Confederacy and Shelby and his men carried the battle to the Yankees throughout the summer. Riding hard from Southern Arkansas, Shelby sat out uh, with between 1,200 and 2,000 men and four pieces of artillery across the Arkansas River near Lewisburg and bagging the uh, 400 odd federal station there. While on the march, the Missourians surprised, quote, a notorious nest of Jayhawkers, boomers and, and deserters on the Fushlafav River, killing 23, wounding two, and capturing two who were shot the next day. Shelby arrived at the Arkansas at Widow Brown's Ford below Lewisburg on May 13, finding the, the river swift and flooded. Regardless, the rebels placed pickets around their camp and prepared to cross the river on a pair of flatboats. 
As darkness fell on May 13, Colonel Benjamin Elliott loaded the flatboat with 50 picked riflemen and 100 uh, volunteer swimmers who stripped and prepared to swim the turbulent Arkansas. Unfortunately for the rebels, they struck a sandbar halfway across the channel, which made the use of the flatboats impractical. The Federals sank the fl their flatboats and headed west in a wide swing toward a, a presumably easier crossing at Dardanelle. Colonel Abraham Ryan, commander of the 3rd Arkansas Cavalry U.S., which was scattered in small garrisons along the Arkansas, reported to Little Rock from Lewisburg on May 15 that there is no doubt that Shelby is in this defense this vicinity and force, including 13 wagons and four pieces of artillery. Fearing that the rebel cavalry were intent on capturing Union River boats, Ryan ordered several boats uh, to Little Rock. Shelby, meanwhile, swung west on the uh, south side of the Arkansas, encountering a scouting party of boomers on a general foray on the 15th, of which he claimed to kill 21. On the evening of the 16th, Shelby near Dardanelle and its small garrison of 400 Union men, also of the 3rd uh, Arkansas Cavalry. The rebels planned to wait and attack the Yankees in the morning, but the stillness was shattered around midnight as Federal troopers encountered the Iron Brigade's vedettes. After a brief exchange of gunfire, the Federals turned and sped back toward Dardanelle with Shelby's troopers in hot pursuit. Shelby's adjutant, John Newman Edwards, wrote in typically purple, purple prose of the fight for Dardanelle. Three times the Federals halted for a checking fire, and as often was their rear swept away and their destruction hastened. Darkness hid many revolting sights, but if the burial bugles had sounded next morning, heaven knows the Third Arkansas would scarcely have had enough men to bury the dead. The majority of the uh, Federal garrison sought to flee the town, with some attempting to cut their way out as others clambered aboard a uh, pair of flatboats and set out across the Arkansas, only to be fired on by Shelby's troopers. Many of them were lost in the swollen river, their cries, their cries ringing wildly out of the air for help and succor, Shelby reported. About 100 men of the garrison surrendered, and Edwards noted that the rebels bagged 86 released Southern prisoners, 150 valuable mules, 11 army wagons, four sutler stores filled with everything, and commissary wagons and impressed Negroes in great abundance. The Confederates quickly crossed the river to Norristown near present-day uh, Russellville, running off a patrol from Lewisburg on May 17. Ryan abandoned Lewisburg, but left behind some 200 smallpox victim, victims, which led Shelby's uh, veteran foragers to ignore the ample Union supplies that were left with the disease victims. The rebel column headed north. As Shelby moved toward Batesville by way of Clinton, Union officers tried to anticipate his movements. Ryan ordered about 150 fugitive Yankees from the Dardanelle garrison to guard the uh, river at Gala Rock, warning Little Rock that it was Shelby's intention to cross the river and operate on Duval's Bluff and the railroad. A party of 200 men of the 3rd Arkansas under Major George Lovejoy was sent toward Clinton on the 19th, and Ryan, and Ryan received orders to take mounted men and hang on to the rebel force. Spare neither men nor horses. Your, mil your military reputation is, is at stake on the proper performance of this duty. Brigadier General J.R. West assembled about 2,000 Union troops at Brownsville to strike once the Confederate forces were located. Or if the Confederate horsemen were located. By the 21st, West was fuming at Brownsville over conflicting reports of Shelby's strength and location. Lovejoy's roving party reported the Missourian as being north of Clinton, while the jittery Ryan placed the rebels at nipping on the flanks of his troops at their new uh, location at Cadron Ferry. Brigadier General E.A. Carr ordered Ryan to set out north immediately, telling the colonel that your men must be as well mounted as Shelby's and we ought to make them him rue, rue the day he crossed the Arkansas. If he goes to Missouri or wherever he goes, follow him as long as men and horses can crawl. A day later, Carr reported that he felt Shelby was actually falling back toward the Arkansas, but Steele ordered Batesville and uh, Jackson Port abandoned and its garrison moved to Duval's Bluff, bringing hundreds of distraught Unionist families with them. Nervous Union officers near Missouri border warned that Shelby was at Osage in Carroll County and prepared to destroy their equipment in the face of the rev perceived rebel threat. It was not until May 26 that the federal leadership felt confident that Shelby had crossed the uh, Little Red River and was in the area between that river and the White. The Confederate cavalry had traveled into the mountainous, uh, mountains through Clinton and Richwoods, encountering no organized forces, but quite pleased with the consternation they were visiting on their Union foes. On May 25, they collided with Bill Williams, quote, who commands a company of hybrid deserters, Negroes, woman ravishers, and Federals. 
The Iron Brigade charged uh, this group of mountain irregulars, which suffered 47 uh, killed and two captured, both of whom were killed the following day. Shelby, who assumed command of all rebel troops north of the uh, Arkansas on May 31, set about his two tasks, bringing a measure of order to a region of the state that was teeming with armed bands like uh, that of Bill Williams and recruiting or conscripting additional troops to pressure the federal lines between Little Rock and Duvall's Bluff. Shelby reported that, I found the entire country overrun with able-bodied men, recruiting officers quarreling or sunk in total apathy, predatory bands of thieves roaming over the country at will, killing some, burning the feet of others, and all hungering with the lust of robbery. One officer refusing to report to another, no organization, no discipline, no, uh, no arms, no leader, no desire to fight, no anything. Even without Shelby's hyperbole, the kid conditions in northern Arkansas were bleak indeed. With characteristic vigor, Shelby assaulted the problem, and, and with bombastic rhetoric, again attributable to the bloviating Edwards, he issued a proclamation to the men of Northeast Arkansas. The Missourian recounted the shameful fraternizing with the Federals throughout the region, where a healthy illicit trade in cotton, horses, and other items prospered, even as the civilian uh, population suffered. And he set a deadline of June 10 for men of military age to enlist. You shall fight for the North or South. I will list you in the uh, Confederate Army or I'll drive you into the federal ranks. You shall not remain idle spectators to a drama enacted before your eyes. Come up like men or go to General Steele like men, but whatever you do, remember the 10th of June. Not trusting an enthusiastic response from the uh, region's irregular population, the, he ordered his lieutenants to set out into the wilderness to bring every man between the ages of 16 and 50 into Confederate service. His orders to Major G.W. Rutherford, a veteran irregular cavalryman from Arkansas, were typical. You will collect together all men of your command, as well as squads of men who may be operating in that section of the country, and cause them to enter the regular service. You must use every exertion in your power to bring these men into the service. All men who are on the north side of the Arkansas and have been paroled and claim to be Vicksburg or Port Hudson prisoners must be arrested and put into a company. All men between the ages of 16 and 50 who will not enter the service voluntarily must be conscripted and put into a company. He will send details under good officers to arrest all bands of Jayhawkers, whether Southern or Union, who may commit, be committing outrages on the citizens. In all cases where the proof is sufficient against any person or persons who may have, uh, may be or have committed depredations upon the citizens of Arkansas, you will cause them to be shot. All squads, unorganized and bands, all squads and unorganized bands must be broken up. Recruiting, whether voluntary or involuntary, proceeded successfully, and Shelby acknowledged the difficulties faced by the uh, civilian population of the region by allowing farmers to avoid service until their crops were brought in. By mid-June, the rebel commander reported that Colonel McRae will have a brigade and Dobbins, Coffee, Freeman, and Coleman full regiments. However, Shelby was not impressed with the overall caliber of his new recruits, writing, they are undisciplined, unlettered, undrilled, and their newly elected field and company officers are disposed to continue their old bushwhacking style of letting them do pretty much as they please. As May rolled into June, the Union Army remained unsure of Shelby's intentions, though most suspected he was planning another raid into his home state. Scouts were sent from Memphis, Duval's Bluff, Huntersville, Lewisburg, all seeking to divine encounter the, uh, encounter the rebel horsemen. Colonel W.F. Cloud of the 2nd Kansas Cavalry, maintaining precarious control over uh, uh, Clarksville, voiced the general nervousness of federal Arkansas when he reported, I do not have the force here to enable me to scout for Shelby and can only depend upon others to apprise me of the approaching danger from afar. When he comes, I do not expect him to cast his shadow before him. Frederick Steele, the federal commander in Arkansas, was clearly frustrated, writing on June 14, it seems that Shelby is everywhere, on the other side of White River and at Crockett's Bluff on this side, with considerable force for the purpose of capturing steamers. After, quote, lingering in the soft spring weather between Batesville and Jacksonport, waiting for my uh, command to regain its elan and their horsemen their strength, Shelby and his men set out for Clarendon on June 15, with Edwards describing the general's plan. The Ball's Bluff, the point nearest Little Rock on the river, connected with it by a railroad, the only one then in Arkansas. The railroad supported General Steele's army. Duval's Bluff was strongly fortified, guarded by gunboats and heavily garrisoned. 
for indeed it was the heart which supplied the federal armies of Arkansas with blood. Therefore, General Shelby determined to grapple a river at a point uh, below this town, blackmail it with his battery, and kill the patient by striking the most vital part. Shelby crossed the Cache River on June 20, the Confederates slogging along sodden, uh, muddy roads, finally entering Clarendon around midnight of June 24. The whole country was one vast swamp at that time on account of recent rains, one of uh, Collins' artillerymen remem remembered later. We marched camp, cooked, and slept in water from two to six inches deep until the morning of the 23rd. Then we encamped on land about 12 inches above high water. Slipping into Clarendon, they found gunboat number 26, the Queen City, at anchor. A 212-ton sidewheel steamer, the tin-clad Queen City was part of a flotilla that had been prowling the White River in, in anticipation of action from uh, Shelby. Her sister ships, the Nomke, the Fawn, and the Tyler, were at Duval's Bluff preparing to escort a fleet of nine transports up the Arkansas River. Armed with two 30-pounder Parrot rifles, two 32-pound cannon, four 24-pounder howitzers, and a 12-pounder gun, and manned by a crew of 60, the Queen City provided formidable coverage of the White River between Clarendon and Duval's Bluff. Shelby's Iron Brigade and Dick Collins' four-gun battery quietly moved into position on the banks of the White, a bare 50 feet from the Queen City, setting their sights on the unsuspecting warship. At about 4 a.m., Shelby gave the order to fire. A yell of 1,000 exultant men, a sharp, deadly crash of 1,000 muskets, the roar of four pieces of doubly loaded cannon, and the thunderbolt crashed against the iron sides of the Queen City, Edwards remembered later. Gunboat number 26 was helpless, swinging at anchor under the relentless hammering of the rebel fire. The vessel's starboard engine was destroyed within minutes, its port engine crippled by a pierced steam pipe. In 10 minutes, Shelby reported, the Queen City was a helpless wreck upon the water. Acting Master Michael Hickey and his crew fought back for 15 or 20 minutes, but their resistance was useless. The wounded skipper gave his crew a choice between surrender or swimming to safety. More than 30 of the crew abandoned ship, ship at least two of whom drowned. Hickey and about 24 others surrendered with the, uh, with the vessel. The Queen City was so badly damaged that Shelby's men had to help pull her to shore. One seaman was killed and nine were wounded. Shelby apparently suffered no casualties in this attack. The rebel cavalrymen swarmed aboard the vessel, quickly relieving the crew of its money and seizing some 50 stand of small arms, most of the Queen City's ammunition and all of her commissary supplies. Fearing the appearance of other federal gunboats, the Confederates removed the 24-pounder and the ship's 12-pounder. Joseph Pollock of the 6th, Calvary, uh, 6th Missouri Cavalry Confederate remembered later, in 20 minutes after all that was valuable had been, all that was valuable had been taken off, the earth reeled and trees trembled under the shock of the final destruction of the Queen City, and the waters closed over the remains of what had been two hours before a gallant mail-clad vessel. The, rebel, the rebels quickly removed their, uh, ar moved their artillery battery, formed volunteer crews for the Queen City's erstwhile artillery, and prepared to receive a counterattack. It was not long in coming. The Tyler, Nomkeeg, and Fawn left the Vols Bluff at daylight on the 24th, preparing to escort nine uh, transports up the Arkansas River. About 10 miles from Clarendon, the flotilla discovered some of the fugitive seamen who had uh, fled the Queen City. Turning the transports back to the Vols Bluff, the three warships continued downstream. Lieutenant George M. Bach led the uh, flotilla aboard the Tyler, which was followed by the Nomkeeg and the Fawn. As the Yankee warships passed the mouth of the Cache River, the Confederate artillery opened up. A shot tore through the uh, Tyler's pilot house as the vessel drew close to Shelby's position. Then, quote, steaming slowly past, we gave them broadside after broadside of one half second shrapnel and canister. The Fawn was soon left out of action by the mortal wounding of her pilot, but the Tyler and Nomke uh, turned about and released another uh, blistering shower of metal on the rebel cavalrymen. The Confederates were clearly outgunned, and the gunboats had their position in a crossfire, so Shelby ordered a retreat, reporting that. Their vast, of metal, their vast superiority of metal was telling heavily on my command, and with the two new guns dismounted and the Tyler within 50 yards, vomiting bushels of grape and canister at every discharge, I withdrew from the unequal contest. Federal cannoneer Coleman Smith was glad of the order, writing later that a jackrabbit would have died of envy if he had seen me going across that open field and through the woods. I did not see the retreat, so I can't describe it. 
Several shells from the gunboat passed me on my way to camp, but I overtook one and passed it before I reached the camp. The short, fierce fight was a damaging one for the Federal uh, vessels. The Tyler was holed 11 times in the fight and suffered six wounded soldiers. The Namkeeg also was holed at least twice, and her actor's uh, acting master's mate was mortally wounded. The Fawn suffered the most. Her captain described the damage. A shell entered the pilot house, tearing up the floor and throwing splinters in every direction. One came across the hurricane deck, striking the hog chain brace. Another passed forward between the chimneys, tearing the deck and destroying a, a harness cask, which was standing there, filled with water. Three shells entered the casemate on the uh, port side, disabling the guns, the crews of two guns. A shrapnel entered the hole amidships, ranging to the starboard, then passing forward, exploded under the fossil deck. Two shells entered the stern, one passing through the blacksmith's forge and bursting back the back of the uh, throttle valve, the other exploding over the starboard engine. One shell, shell burst though, on the outside over the uh, starboard crank, cutting in two the main hog chain and brace. Eleven members of the uh, Fawn's crew were wounded, one mortally. Shelby's losses were unreported in what would prove to be the only Confederate seizure of a Union warship in Arkansas. Shelby fell back two miles from Clarendon as the Union sailors seized the material left behind by the Iron Brigade, then returned to the uh, outskirts of town that night to throw up temporary earthworks. However, the non Keegan Fawn returned the, to Clarendon on the 25th and shelled the rebels until they withdrew out of range of the big naval guns. The two warships ranged the White River warily before Clarendon as the Missouri horsemen waited to see what would happen next. They found out the next morning. A task force under Brigadier General Eugene A. Carr, a West Pointer who had won a Medal of Honor at Pea Ridge, left Duval's Bluff at 2 p.m. on June 25, loaded onto transports guarded by the Tyler. An accident uh, partially disabled the Tyler on the way down river, pre preventing the troops from landing at Clarendon until 9 a.m. on June 26. There, a force of 750 cavalry trooper troopers and around 2,000 infantrymen, accompanied by a battery of artillery, disembarked without opposition and swiftly moved out in pursuit of the Confederates who destroyed the Queen City. Cavalry skirmishers rode forward about three-fourths of a mile before encountering their counterparts in Shelby's force, and infantrymen rushed their, uh, to their relief. Forming into line of battle, Carr's little army moved forward, forcing Shelby's cavalrymen to stubbornly give ground before them in what Yankee, one Yankee soldier described as a smart skirmish. As soon as our battery opened on them, they began to fall back, an Illinois uh, soldier wrote of the uh, battle. After the battery ceased firing, our boys began to drive them and would have captured one piece if they had been uh, permitted, permitted to charge it. We chased them so closely that they had to abandon one artillery piece after spiking it with a horseshoe nail. The Federals drove the rebels to Pikeville. The Federals drove the rebels to Pikeville, where the roads to Helen and Cotton Plant Fork, and Carr ordered a rest around noon to realign his troops. Shelby is practicing, is practicing his old tricks, Carr reported from uh, Pikeville, and indeed he was. Utilizing delaying tactics he had been perfecting since the Battle of Cane Hill in November of 1862. The Missourians would drop back, form a line in a convenient wood line, fire a volley from rifle or cannon to stop their pursuers, and fall back to another defensible position. I fought them every hundred yards for ten miles, Shelby wrote. They followed all day long, not furiously as I've seen them, but steadily and tenaciously. After about three hours of skirmishing, Shelby, Shelby fell back with too much rapidity for infantry to follow. Carr continued moving forward uh, and uh, struck again at Shelby on the morning of the 27th, attacking vigorously and driving the rebels back five or six miles. Shelby counterattacked and in turn forced the Federals back three miles. Shelby claimed 250 Yankees killed or wounded over the three days, while 30 will cover my entire loss, but most of these can never be replaced in the world. Carr abandoned his three-day, 30-mile pursuit on June 28, reporting that he had captured two guns, killed 12, wounded 60, and captured 12, while suffering one killed and 16 wounded. My infantry was not, has not touched them since the first day, though I have pressed them to the utmost, he wrote. Many are reported sunstruck, their shoes are many of them soaked to pieces going through mud and swamps, and some of them left their rations on the first battlefield. Neither my cavalry nor my uh, art artillery horses have had a feed of grain since we started, and some of the artillery are unshod. The weary Yankees limped back into Duval's Bluff on June 29th.
With Shelby's withdrawal from Clarendon, the Clarendon area, Frederick Steele decided to seize the initiative and take the battle to the Confederates. It is reported by scouts that Shelby has crossed the White River at Jackson Port and is marching in the direction of Searcy, Steele reported on July 1. I shall endeavor to prevent his crossing the Arkansas. With additional forces, it is my opinion that we should at least capture Shelby's artillery and scatter his conscripts, reported to be between uh, some 4,000 or 5,000 in number. On the same day, a scout from the veteran 10th Illinois Cavalry was sent towards Searcy, and strong daily patrols were ordered along the railroad line between Little Rock and Duval's Bluff. To protect the supply and communication line of the White River, the Navy called in the big guns, with Lieutenant Commander S.L. Phelps informing Steele on Ju Ju 3, July 3 that I have brought one of the turtles, the Carondelet, up to Clarendon, where she will remain as long as there is water for her. I know a fancy Shelby will have a good time if he runs against her. Despite the uh, added firepower of the Carondelet, however, Phelps warned that I am sure it will not do to let vessels uh, run without a convoy for a while. Shelby is only a few minutes from Clarendon and we'll try again. The aggressive Union posture began to tell as federal forays struck out to attack Confederate forces wherever they found them. A Yankee expedition from Lewisburg struck a group in Searcy County that was organized, uh, organizing to join Shelby on July 7, killing seven, wound, wounding four, and capturing 55 men and their equipment. A scout from the 10th Illinois Cavalry out of Huntersville killed and wounded five a day later. A large scout of 250 men from the Illinois Regiment left Little Rock on July 8 to occupy Searcy and keep an eye out for she uh, Shelby. A regiment of Shelby's men under Colonel B. Frank Gordon soon set out from Jackson Port to answer the Illinois horsemen's challenge, setting out toward their camp at Bayou des Arc. At 4.30 a.m. on July 14, Gordon's soldiers fell on the sleeping camp of the 10th Illinois, attacking from three sides. The four sleepy guards died at their post like men, Edwards wrote later. Captain D.H. Wilson of the 10th immediately ordered his bugler to sound to horse. The Yankee troopers mounted and formed into line, then mounted, dismounted, and fell back toward the bayou when, quote, they received volleys from three squadrons of the enemy that had advanced on the north side of the bayou, dismounted, and crossed the bayou and lay under the south bank. Wilson then desperately ordered his men to remount and fight their way out of the closing pincers of Gordon's attack as howling rebels closed in from the left and right. I went into the fight with 214 men and seven officers and came out with 75 men and five officers, Will Wilson reported. Shelby wrote later, this boasted regiment, which has weekly made pilgrimages to Circe and thrown us the gauge of defiance, was whipped, routed, and scattered, and only saved from utter, utter annihilation by the superior quality of its forces. The Missourians celebrated their victory by sending a portion of Gordon's, Gordon's force to hit the Memphis to Little Rock Railroad. A half mile of track near uh, Hicks Station was destroyed, the telegraph cut, and 13 hapless Yankees made prisoners. In addition, a train heading to Duval's Bluff from Little Rock steamed into the ruined section of track and derailed, killing an engineer and injuring several others. They were further cheered by the delivery of 840 stand of, of arms and 68,000 rounds of ammunition from east of the Mississippi. Great, greatly needed for Shelby's unarmed uh, recruits. As Gordon raised Kane along the Memphis and Little Rock Railroad, another veteran cavalryman uh, made his presence felt by the Union garrison at Helena. Shelby had dispatched Colonel Archibald Dobbins from his command on June 25 after the attack on the Queen City, instructing, instructing him to conduct operations between the Cache and Mississippi River, to interrupt and harass them in the navigation of White River by every means in your power operating, operating against their boats, either by detached company or with your full force, as you may think best. Dobbins had been a wealthy planter in Phillips County before the war and knew, knew the Helena area well. He wrote to Shelby on July 4 that the federally, federally leased farms in the region made fat targets for attack and plunder. Needing both mounts for new recruits and seeking to, quote, seeing value to, quote, destroying the farms and driving off the stock and Negroes employed on them, Shelby promised to send an additional 250 men under Gordon to cooperate with the Arkansas cavalrymen. Those men were sent down uh, around July 20. On July 25, Brigadier General Napoleon B. Buford, commander of the Federal District of Eastern Arkansas, sent out a reconnaissance and force to ascertain the force and design of Dobbins' command. Led by Colonel W.S. Brooks of the 56 U.S. Colored uh, Infantry, the, pa patrol con con the patrol consisted of 280 men of the 56, 80 from the 60th U.S. Colored Infantry, 
and two-piece uh, two piece section of the uh, second U.S. Colored Artillery under Captain Jonas Fred Lemke. A party of about 150 troopers of the 15th Illinois Cavalry under Major Eagleton Carmichael steamed down the Mississippi to disembark and work its way back up toward uh, Brooks's command. The infantry force approached Big Creek about 22 miles southwest of Helena at 3 a.m. on the 26th, waiting until daylight to send a patrol across the creek. There they were told that Dobbins had left the day before and the patrol rejoined the main body, main body of the infantry. Brooks set out pickets as he considered his next move. Then, an hour later, Dobbins' Arkansians and Missourians slammed into the, the little force, attacking with little warning from three sides. The black soldiers formed into battle lines and opened fire. The task force's two artillery pieces began to roar, even as Brooks and Lemke uh, fell early in the engagement. We formed our lines and held our position under severe and continuous fire from the enemy, their lines having being in places uh, not more than 50 yards from our own. Lieutenant Colonel Moses Reed reported later. For four long hours, the little command fought desperately against Dobbins' horsemen. The black troops were on the verge of being overrun when help arrived suddenly. Carmichael's Illinois cavalrymen had heard the firing from Big Creek as they, uh, uh, as they hunted rebel stragglers near Trenton. They circled around to the rear of the embattled Yankees and charged through part of Dobbins' force stationed in the rear of the black soldiers. The combined Union force then began a fighting withdrawal toward Helena, constantly harried on all sides by Confederate horsemen. At the junction of the Spring Creek Road about 11 miles from Helena, they faced a solid line of rebels, even as other southern horsemen pressed them from behind. We immediately engaged them in front, driving them handsomely for two miles when they did not again molest us, Reed reported. The fight was a hard one for the Union forces, who lost 19 men killed, 40 wounded, and four missing, in addition to losing significant arms and supplies. Dobbins' losses were not reported in what Shelby labeled as another severe fight and another brilliant victory. Union reports list uh, seven re uh, Confederates killed and five captured. The rebels struck again at 8 a.m. on August 1st, attacking the lamb plantation with some 800 horsemen, capturing all the stock and Negroes, old and young, and the white employees. They proceeded there to the J.B. Pillow Place, then proceeded, quote, down all the lease plantations a distance of 10 miles, capturing, burning, destroying, and robbing of money and effects, Buford reported. The Helena commanders sent uh, out 100 Yankee troopers in pursuit of the Confederate force, but the Federals returned back at the Allen Polk Plantation, and the Confederate rear guard closed in behind Dobbins and Gordon and headed west. Buford, his district of eastern Arkansas, undermanned and thinned by sickness, complained that, I have distinctly seen that we should have a raid, and I could not prevent it with so small amount of force. Shelby summarized the plantation rate, plantation rate as gaining 200 mules and 300 Negroes, quantities of good and clothing, and killed 75 mongrel soldiers, Negroes, and Yankee schoolmasters. Shelby, meanwhile, had followed up on the July 14 attack on the 10th Illinois Cavalry by planning a two-pronged uh, blow against Union forces in the Grand Prairie a raid of the railroad with a thousand men under Colonel Thomas H. McRae and a return to prey on the White River's traffic by 800 men under Shelby. The two columns left Jackson Port on July 26. Shelby took up position on the White River about seven miles below Clarendon on July 31, narrow, narrowly missing, uh, avoiding discovery by a pair of Union gunboats and waited for inviting uh, targets to present themselves. The success of McRae's column, however, quickly doomed Shelby's operations on the White. McCray had his men hit the Memphis to Little Rock Railroad hard, with a 500-man uh, column under Colonel Coleman first ripping lines and burning trestles, and 500 more men under Colonel Jackman darting in a day later to destroy a mile of railroad track. One day last week, a train coming in from Duval's Bluff was fired upon by three separate squads of men arranged along the road, not more than 10 miles from this place, the Little Rock Unconditional uh, Union wailed. Shelby reported that these attacks stirred up a complete hornet's nest. From Duval's Bluff to Little Rock, the road was swarming with large bodies of infantry and cavalry, and McRae was forced back as rapidly as he came. Hearing reports that a large federal force was heading for Des Arc, threatening his line of retreat, Shelby, ra Shelby raised the blockade of the White River, for I could not wait there with a heavy force in my rear and my newly recruited and unarmed men uh, unprotected wholly. The rebel audacity led Steele to again go on the offensive, this time ordering Brigadier General J.R. West to take all available cavalry of this district, 
and attack McCray's troops, who are reported to have fallen back to the Little Red River. This is the third expedition I have fitted out with, against Shelby within a few weeks, Steel Fume. The excuse given for not catching him or, not, that, or they could not get supplies and are, ob, uh, and are obliged to return. West set out for Little Rock on August 6, having established two provisional brigades for the expedition. The 1st Brigade left Duval's Bluff with 1,500 horsemen and orders to move towards Searcy, breaking off a, false, a small force to go by Hickory Plains and unite with the 2nd Column from Little Rock. Brigadier General uh, C.C. Andrews, commanding the post at Duval, Duval's Bluff, told his commander, You realize better than I can tell you that it is desirable to pursue and crush this notorious and growing force of the enemy. Impress upon your officers, officers and men and have them impress upon their men how extremely important it is to exterminate this gang. The second brigade uh, left out of Little Rock and had an aggregate strength of 3,094 men. Geiger's command came from Duval's Bluff, like a thunderbolt, Shelby said, and hit about 300 of McCray's men at Hickory Plains on August 7, killing four and capturing seven men. The expedition soon became a desultory series of marches and countermarches, with the Yankees heading toward Jacksonport, destroying a salt work at Grand Glaze, sending two regiments across the Wright River at Augusta, then bringing them back and finally returning to Little Rock and Duval's Bluff on August 16 and 17, having accomplished little more than wearing out men and horses under the wary eyes of Shelby's men. The Missourian, the Missourian was soon on the attack once more. Duval's Bluff was a major cavalry depot, and supplying the post-substantial herd of horses and mules with fodder was an important and dangerous job. The Federal Hay Station west of the Bluff made tempting targets for Southern horsemen, both regular and irregular, and the pressure on them was strong throughout the summer. Some 200 rebel horsemen hit the 11th Missouri Cavalry at Hay Station No. 3 on July 30, losing one killed but seizing 18 civilian hay, cutter, hay cutters and 18 to 20 horses. 3rd Michigan Cavalry troops guarding the, a herd near the Remount camp were attacked by guerrillas on August 5, and 13 men of the uh, 54th Illinois Infantry, in, Illinois Infantry on a hay cutting duty were captured on August 12. The task of securing fodder on the prairie west of Duval's Bluff was hot, dangerous, and nerve-wracking for the Yankee soldiers and civilian employees who ventured from the bluff. As late August approached, the five stations scattered along a line between 8 and 12 miles west of Pine Bluff were guarded by the veteran 54th Illinois and detachments of the 1st Nebraska Cavalry. On August 20, Shelby, believing that Price was heading north, Sterling Price was heading north across the Arkansas River, set out with between 2,000 and 2,500 men from his camps around Searcy to hit the railroad. Heading south, he detached a force under Dobbins at Austin to guard the single bridge across the swollen Big Cypress Creek. Then, on the morning of August 24, he approached the uh, extensive hay-cutting operations between Jones Station and Ashley Station. Dressed in captured federal uniforms, quote, slowly in columns of fours, the old division and McRae's brigade marched leisurely along with Collins' battery halfway down the line. Then the two ammunition wagons, then a small guard, maybe three squadrons behind the wagons, and altogether the whole thing looked exactly like a federal expedition returning carelessly from a four-day scout. The unsuspecting federals and the civilian contractors cutting hay were caught by surprise, scattered across the prairie in small groups. Sending Colonel uh, DeWitt C. Hunter's uh, cavalry regiment east to guard against reinforcements from Duval's Bluff, Shelby swept into the attack. Approaching the first fort, manned by two companies of the 54th Illinois and troopers of the 1st Nebraska Cavalry, Shelby demanded its surrender and was told, if you want this force, come and take it. The 12th Missouri Cavalry, a Confederate, formed into columns of twos and charged. The Missourians galloped to within 50, uh, 30 paces of the fort, dismounted, and charged on foot. It was not long before, high over the white burst of the powder cloud that drifted and floated away from before the battle breeze, a white flag waved out as a token of surrender. Confederate cavalryman George Campbell, among those charging, noted, On my right hand was a young soldier named Bledsoe, pistol in hand, aiming to shoot a Federal soldier. I knocked the pistol up, pushed up, pushed him down the bank, and stopped him. The young Federal stood trembling like a leaf, the tears rolling down his cheeks. Gobbling 150 prisoners, 200 small arms, and assorted supplies, the rebels, the rebels fired the hay bale fort and headed west toward the next fort. This too fell swiftly adding 100 more rebels, uh, soldiers to the rebels' tally, and then the third was captured along with 50 more Yankees. Fugitives from the first three forts and the parties from the prairie streamed toward uh, Fort Number 4 as Colonel G.M. Mitchell of the 54th sent a desperate message to Duval's Bluff. 
I'm surrounded by a large number of cavalry from the north of the railroad. Ashley Station surrendered and Hay burned. I've concentrated six companies at this station and will fight to the last. Send help if possible. The Grim Yankees loaded their weapons and awaited the next rebel onslaught. It was not long in coming as three rebel uh, regiments charged the fort, which had been under fire from Collins' battery. Edwards described the action. The Illinoisans stood their guns manfully, and man many of the old brigade fell dead or hard hit as they went up to the grapple. But the survivors, leaping the ditch, poured a deadly fusillade into the crowded works. Three times a white flag went up for quarter, and three times some bold, proud hand snatched it down to renew the fight. Looking toward Duval's bluff, the Illinois, the Illinois infantrymen saw a relief column of federal cavalrymen approaching. The men of the 54th made a desperate rush from Fort No. 4, and, quote, sharp and brief was the chase. When within 500 yards of their friends, the Federals were overtaken, surrounded, ridden over, and Colonel Mitchell and 450, 450 of his officers and men surrendered unconditionally. Brigadier General Christopher Columbus Andrews had received his, his first message of the disaster at Ashley's Station at 12.30 p.m. from a soldier of the 1st Nebraska Cavalry and immediately sent Colonel W.F. Geiger West with 900 troopers of the 8th and 11th U.S. Uh, Missouri Cavalry and the 9th Iowa Cavalry. Geiger approached the column of smoke from the burning uh, forts and hay baling machines and deployed the 8th Missouri even as the sound of cannon ceased firing from, from around the beleaguered federal works and the hapless members of the 54th were hurried north toward the timber line. Seeing rebel cavalrymen formed in line of battle north of the railroad, the Yankee colonel ordered the 11th Missouri to cut across the tracks and threaten the rebels' left flank. The 8th moving against their front and the 9th Iowa hanging back in reserve. Rebel muskets and Yankee carbines cracked across the prairie. The combatants attempting to turn each other's left even as the Confederates slowly fell back across the flat, featureless landscape. Fighting on the open prairie was somewhat surreal for the combatants. Confederate Sidney Jackman noted, there was not a twig, much less a tree, between them and us. Union, uh, Union Missourian Albert DeMuth described it thus, I have been in some seven or eight battles and skirmishes, but this is the first one I ever saw. It was out on the open prairie where every motion of the enemy could be seen, and there we stood for one long hour, firing away at each other, neither party willing to quit first. As night approached, Geiger broke off the engagement, having lost nine killed, 43 wounded, and one missing. In Little Rock, Brigadier General Eugene A. Carr immediately began sending troops east to the aid of Duval's Bluff. 700 uh, infantry heading from, headed from Brownsville on the 24th with promises of an equal number of the 9th Kansas Cavalry to arrive the next morning, along with other cavalry to protect the railroad. Some 800 troopers of the 9th Kansas followed Shelby as far as Big Cypress Creek on August 26th. There they clashed with the Confederate uh, rear guard under Colonel B.F. Gordon, who was stood three charges by the Federals before retiring. Brigadier General J.R. West left Duval's Bluff on August 27 with 600 men who joined with the Kansas cavalrymen to make another ineffectual pursuit of Shelby's men who, quote, returned to White River without further molestation. Shelby's action at Ashley Station would be the final major act of what had been a busy and rewarding summer for the Confederates and a costly and humility, a humiliating one for Frederick Steele's Northerner. Shelby reported, the immediate and tangible fruits of my expedition are 577 prisoners, including one field officer and 11 line officer, over 200 Federals killed and wounded, 10 miles of railroad track destroyed completely, the ties torn up and burned, the iron heated and bent, telegraph destroyed, bridges and trestle works ruined, 3,000 bales of hay destroyed by fire, 20 hay machines chopped to pieces, five forts razed to the ground, 500 stand of small arms distributed to my unarmed men, many fine horses captured, 12 barrels of salt, uh, salt brought off the field and given to a command suffering for it, besides supplying many needy soldiers with boots, blankets, shoes, hats, and clothing. All this done within six miles of Duval's Bluff, and my detail was tearing up the track while the enemy's bullets fired at the, by the, at the covering regiments were throwing splinters from the ties into their very faces. Shelby lost a total of 173 men killed and wounded in the uh, expedition against the hay cutting operations along the Little Rock and Memphis Railroad. The successful raid on Ashley Station provided an exclamation point to the chapter of uh, Shelby, Joseph Shelby's uh, operations in Arkansas during the summer of 1864. In writing of the defeat of the 54th Illinois, the uh, 
unconditional union summarized the Missourians' accomplishment and the failure of federal authorities. What he has accomplished since he crossed the Arkansas River with 2,500 men, without support in a country stripped of everything, without supplies of any kind in the face of our forces, holding a line which completely severed his connection with the rebel South, Shows, conclusive, shows conclusively the superior effectiveness of their policy and the weakness of ours. They put every man in the field, willing or unwilling, and make him fight or work. They send all sympathizers beyond their lines so that it is impossible for them to communicate a knowledge of their movements. They convert every man, woman, and child into a spy and send them to our posts to get supplies and information. The rebel army divested of the transportation they had captured from us and the clothing and other supplies they have smuggled and in various other ways passed through our lines would not be able to take the field with half its effective force. Over the summer, Shelby had gathered thousands of recruits for Confederate operations, killed, wounded, or captured uh, hundreds of federal soldiers, hindered transportation on the White River, seized weapons of uh, formerly enslaved people and materiel, hampered the operations of the only railroad in Arkansas, and sank a un United States warship, all the while keeping Union operations in turmoil. The action of Shelby and his men revealed the flaws of Steele's strategy of maintaining a porous system of fortified positions while leaving the countryside at large in the hands of the rebels, or worse, under the control of the bloodthirsty partisans who raided military and civilian targets with equal impunity. And Shelby tied up much of the Union Army in Arkansas as Major General Sterling Price gathered his forces for his doomed invasion of Missouri that fall. Shelby and his men would again distinguish themselves in Price's raid, but that is another story. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at mchrist at cals.org and have a nice day.